Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. Linux, <laughs> Linux, and he's like, no, 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 no. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows that we have over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. For those of you who have, thank you so much for supporting the show. And uh, you can find us online over at quicksurf.com. In the show notes for each and every episode, I have links under the subscribe heading to subscribe to an Og Vorbis feed, an MP3 feed, or a video feed that's compatible with a wide range of devices. So feel free to subscribe to any of those. If that's not really your cup of tea, uh, you can also find us online over at YouTube, blip.tv, Daily Motion. Uh, you can listen to us on uh, Stitcher Radio over at stitcher.com and at tunein.com. So the, try, I'm trying to have a, a nice cornucopia of uh, places to uh, find the Geekinator and both Linux news log uh, online. Let's go ahead and get into the, some of the cool stuff that I found for this episode. Um, over at Make Magazine, uh, at blog.makesign.com, there's an article here by Guy Calva Calva Cavalcanti. I'm sorry, I totally slaughtered your last name. I should know it because you're on the, the big brain theory. Um, this is entitled Making Makerspaces, Creating a Business Model. Now, obviously, you know, it's it's great to have makerspaces where it's all warm and fuzzy and everybody's, the you know, doing the kumbaya. But more often than not, you know, you kind of have to run it as a business. You have to have a business model in order to keep the space, you know, rent paid for and to have tools and supplies and all that other stuff. So uh, as, as, as great as it, is, as it is to have like a community space that's all volunteer driven and everything, sometimes that doesn't always happen. So anyway, this is a great write-up by Guy on uh, having a business model for your maker space. So definitely check it out, especially if you're looking to get into maker spaces. From geekygadgets.com, Intel announces a new quad-core mobile processors. That's right. Uh, there have been some new quad-core mobile processors announced by Intel for mobile devices. The Intel Baytrail system on a chip, which comes with a built-in LTE modem from Intel. The new processors are built on a new microarchitecture, which will allow up to eight cores in the future. That is a lot of cores. Uh, so definitely give this a, a check. It's uh, pretty neat. From uh, Projects with Ryan Slaw, it's Hackbot. This is over at Make Magazine. The Hackbot on the move. Yes, the wheels are tuna fish cans with rubber bands for traction. In this video, he shows us how to, uh, the steps to build our own robot and talk a little, about, a little bit about program, programming it to move. Boy, I am having just the worst time right now. I've got something in my eye, and it's totally uh, messing me up being able to read. Um, a lot of what uh, he built this with is with parts that he found uh, already you know, in his shop that were just laying around. So definitely give it a whirl. It's a nice YouTube video. It's uh, almost seven minutes long. Uh, definitely an interesting read. And it's Arduino-powered. Yay! From Slash Gear, Intel Thunderbolt 2 offers 4K video display and transfer. So we talked about uh, on the last Geekinator, the new 4K monitor that Asus has released. And I thought maybe DisplayPort or Thunderbolt uh, was able to, to uh, support 4K displays. Well, apparently Thunderbolt itself doesn't have enough bandwidth to do it. I still need to look into whether or not DisplayPort supports that, but Thunderbolt uh, and DisplayPort are not the same thing. Uh, so even though they use the same connector on 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 uh, you know MacBook Pros and that's newer MacBook Pros and that sort of thing, they're not the same thing. Anyway, uh, Thunderbolt Two is it's built on the current Thunderbolt technology. You can do 4K video transfer and display simultaneously. Current plans have production starting by the end of this year and kicking into full gear in 2014. 
So this uh, is pretty interesting. It's a the biggest change is a new bi-directional channel which takes two current 10 gigabits channels which are independent of each other and merges them into a single 20 gigabits per channel that flows both ways. As such, this allows for 4K video transfer and display at the same time if desired. So pretty neat. Uh, so what does this really mean? Well, you can stream 4K video to a display while at the same time backing that file up to separate drives. Pretty interesting. So it seems like, you know, the technology to master, you know, really master in 4K uh, natively is starting to come about. You know, I mean, you see 4K, you know, being mastered in movies and stuff, particularly with digital videos, but more often than not, particularly if they're shooting with red cameras or raw or, or that sort of thing, they have a lower resolution uh, uh, proxy file, if you will, that serves as a an intermediate that they use, you know, to get, you know, their cut and their edit and all that other stuff right. And then from that edit decision list, they go and master out a, a master file for distribution. So anyway, pretty interesting. Uh, from Geeky Gadgets, Feedly to get Windows 8 support and more. This is pretty neat. I am a huge user of Feedly. This I, I use it like it's, you know, ever since Google has announced that they're shutting Reader down, which quite frankly is should be criminal. Uh, I've taken to using Feedly. I've tried a few other services and, you know, I got to have it to where no matter what computer I'm on or if I'm on my phone or what have you, I've got my feeds. Google Reader was awesome for that. Uh, Feedly by and far is the better one of those uh, uh, of the few that that are trying to replace Google Reader. Uh, here they are getting a, a native Windows 8 app, which is pretty awesome. So definitely check it out. From Ars Technica, ooh, hit my microphone here. Uh, seat of Power, the computer workstation for the person with everything. This is awesome. I want one. Unfortunately, it costs $21,500, and so I will never have one. However, I would love to have one in my man cave. I'd love to do this show from it. That would be pretty sweet. Anyway, uh, definitely check it out. It looks uh, pretty futuristic for sure. I mean, this is, this is you know, straight into man cave territory. Tool Time Tim uh, reminds me, uh, this just, just seeing this, it reminds me of Tool Time Tim and his man bathrooms and all that other good stuff. Pretty neat. Uh, from Engadget, CBS acquires all of TV Guide Digital. TV Guide Digital has fared well between its web portal and mobile apps, but part owner CBS thinks there's a lot of potential locked away. Enough so, in fact, that CBS is taking over TV Guide Digital by acquiring LionGate's remaining 50% stake in the venture. I don't even know what this means. I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what this means. I, this is... How do we know that they're going to, you know... Oh, man, that's just lots of questions. Anyway, um, definitely check it out. Also from Ars Technica... What's the right balance between code consistency and code improvement? This is something that, as a programmer, I always uh, have to ask myself. Um, consistency versus best practice. There are two competing interests. Anytime a dev is working on legacy code, if link hasn't been used previously, should it be used today? To what extent are patterns part of code style? And where should we draw the line between staying consistent and making improvements? This happens particularly when you when you inherit an existing code base that was done differently than how you would have done it if you were doing it from scratch. Um, this is part of the ongoing technology lab slash information technology uh, section of Ars Technica where they find a question that some developer asked and solicit feedback. I know, you know, there really is no way I tend to err on the side of maintainability. You know, if I inherit somebody's code and find it less maintainable than I would prefer, that's kind of my benchmark for whether or not I change it. You know, I, improvements are very subjective. Um, 
improvements in what performance improvements in using newer libraries you don't necessarily need to use a newer library you know it, definitely you want to use newer libraries or newer versions of libraries if those libraries were released to to because uh to, to fix security issues but you know change just for the sake of change isn't necessarily a good thing um, if you can make the change and it simplifies your code base and makes it more maintainable, absolutely. But I always err on what's more maintainable. Sometimes that means you don't change anything. You go in there, you do a patch, you fix the one little micro bug that happened or whatever the case may be. More often than not, if the code has larger problems than that, that's also a time where you go, maybe it's a good idea to think about re-architecting this so it's more maintainable and more stable, you know. Um, it, it, it's very subjective, but you know, that's kind of where I err towards is maintainability, long-term maintainability first stability and then performance from Ars Technica. Again, 11 Arduino projects that will require major hacking skills or a bit of insanity. Yeah, we like insanity. Raspberry Pi has received the lion's share of attention devoted to cheap single board computers in the past year, but long before the Pi was a gleam in its creator's eyes, there was the Arduino, and I'm a huge fan of the Arduino. Yeah, unveiled in 2005, Arduino boards don't have the CPU horsepower of a Raspberry Pi. They don't run a full PC operating system either. Arduino isn't obsolete, though. In fact, its plethora of connectivity options makes it the better choice for many electronics projects. I mean, I totally get this. Raspberry Pi largely is, uh, you, you know, a, a, a small computer that has a fair amount of connectivity and some libraries so that you can talk to that connectivity. But it's like a Linux, you know, it's like, oh, wow, I have this little experimental computer, you know, uh, uh, an Arduino is I have this for all intents and purposes, and this is how I largely use it, I have this circuit that I can program behavior into. It's really that simple. I have this circuit that I can program behavior into. That's it. You know, that's where the Arduino really shines. It allows you to wire up circuits that you can program behavior into. It's a lot harder to do that on a Raspberry Pi. There's a lot more to maintain. You have to keep the Linux distribution up to date with this. It's exceedingly embeddable uh, with an Arduino. You can get right in there. You can embed that bad boy. Uh, if you know, you know, if you've got your chip and you just need some bare basic stuff, you've, you know, and you've got your prototype on like an Arduino Do or, you know, uh, or an Uno, like uh, what I use for a lot of my stuff here, an Arduino Uno. If uh, you know, if you've got it prototyped in that, and you've and you've got a chip, you know, and you know just the circuits that you need, you can do that. Get that bad boy on a custom little circuit and get it embedded. It's awesome for that stuff that would take you if you had to program that kind of uh, behavior or, or logic or such sort of thing using you know actual circuits much much harder to do this you know simplifies a lot of things sure you have to code but still simplifies a lot of things anyway um pretty interesting this lists 11 there's a there's a fair amount of youtube videos in it <laughs> i thought it was awesome and definitely that's why i'm sharing it with you from giga ohm now we've talked about the whole adobe creative cloud thing and how many people are upset about it i personally have no problem with it i think it's the greatest thing ever it's lowered the barrier of entry for me otherwise i would have never purchased a creative suite uh, cs6 i believe was the version that i was looking at getting when creative cloud was released i would have never done it because i, I couldn't afford it but amortizing the cost of it over 50 dollars a month for me works very well uh not everybody it doesn't work very well for everybody. So uh, I've long been a proponent that you should use what works for you. Definitely. Um, you know, if Creative Cloud doesn't work for you, but you still need that type of functionality, this story here at GigaOM, build your own Adobe Creative Suite with cheaper Mac app alternatives is a great place to start. Um, 
he uh giga ohms here the, 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 boy i'm having a tough time jeffrey gets uh the author of this article has a great rundown of a lot of replacements maybe that's not a full feature for feature replacement but it's close enough it'll get you there uh definitely look at it and uh Give it a try if Creative Cloud does not work for you. That will do it for this edition of The Geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes, which you can find online over at quicksurf.com. And uh, please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And for those of you who have, thank you so much for supporting the show. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.